Mr. Bill O'Reilly, who now is making his home at BillOReilly.com, where you can listen to his daily podcast, which is always riveting uh, because he's always exciting and up-tempo and upbeat and positive. Bill, how are you? Are you reading that back, or is that from the heart? No, that is, well, it's not from the heart. Uh, it's more from the, uh, the, the lower regions. The, <laughs> the, the heart of my bottom. Ah, yeah. man, Beck, come on. So how are you, Bill? Um, so what's on your mind today? Well, I got a lot of things. Uh, I'd like to hear your comments on the president's speech in Poland yesterday, which I thought was, was so refreshing to hear. Well, I agree that the message was uh, um, worthy and needed to be said to the Europeans on their own soil. Uh, but I thought it was a standard, I, I said this uh, to my audience, I thought it was a standard political speech in the sense that um, if I were writing that speech, I would have singled out a few examples of where Europe is in trouble. For example, in um, Sweden. Uh, that have that country has accepted uh, way too many uh, refugees and migrants. They can't assimilate them. They are causing all kinds of trouble. A, a big rock uh, music festival had to be canceled because they're afraid that it would get out of control in Sweden. Um, these kinds of things would have made the, the speech more vivid. Um, but I agree with you that the message needed to be said it was ref honestly it was refreshing to hear somebody stand up for the western way of life we haven't yeah, heard that you say it's Barack standard Obama but i haven't heard that in eight that. years and, yeah yeah and and the secular progressives hate it mm. that's what all these demonstrators are about they hate capitalism competition free markets freedom in general these people, you know, loathe that, and they all, you know, gather together to cause trouble. It's not an anti-Trump movement. It's an anti-capitalist movement. Um, I got a note from a friend of mine, Michael Opelka, who does uh, uh, a show on the Blaze Radio, and he said in the early 90s, uh, we, de we debuted a play in the former Soviet Union. Um, he and his brother uh, wrote this play. He said, my brother came home from Russia with a woman he eventually married. My mother took uh, Tatiana to a grocery store to show her where the local market was located. Within seconds, Tatiana was standing stunned, began crying. She could not believe what was in front of her, the products, the variety, just the vast array of food that was available to everyday citizens. We were talking last hour about Poland and, and about how there were, just a few years ago, um, 4,000 items on grocery store shelves. There are now as many as 40,000 different items on grocery store shelves and how the West and the free market system, probably the best testament or monument to it is the grocery store. And well, people don't get it. You know, when I was uh, in Berlin, when the wall came down, we were covering that story and I was there. And when the people from East Berlin poured across into West Berlin, the first place they went to was the grocery store. Mm. And wow. they poured into the grocery stores. And what they wanted most of all, take a guess, what food did the uh, communist prisoners want most of all? Kale. Hamburger helper. <laughs> Kale. I'd say candy. <laughs> Bananas. Mm. Huh. Bananas. Bananas. They swarm. It's really uninteresting. <laughs> I mean, uh, let's just be honest here, Bill. Right, so let me, I mean, let me, if you wait a minute, hang on. If you're a prisoner behind the Iron Curtain, the, the highest thing you're dreaming of is a banana. That's pretty sad. That's sad. I just want to put this into perspective for Beck listeners. Tatiana going to the grocery store and crying is more interesting than an eyewitness yes. report from Berlin. And the answer to that is yes. <laughs> I think... Yeah. I is think, that what you're telling me? I yes. think so, Bill. I yes. think mainly because of the way the story was told. <laughs> oh, I see. I got it. <laughs> Next time, Bill, you need to read an email from your friend. Maybe then it'll be yeah. interesting to everybody. Right. From, from my friend Kurt. <laughs> banana, banana. Above all. <laughs> All right, that was a great story, Bill, and I 
I'm so yeah, glad that back. I really appreciate it. I will take that banana story with me to my grave uh, <laughs> as one of the greatest <laughs> moments of airtime. Um, all right, so uh, let's 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 shift gears a bit. Um, we haven't heard your take yet on uh, on the CNN, you know, Donald Trump tweet clown show thing. Um, I think it is a fact now that CNN, MSNBC, the network news broadcasts, along with the progressive newspapers, have basically stopped covering the news in a fair way and have put together a program to try to destroy Donald Trump. Would everybody agree with that? Yeah, but don't they don't when yeah. will they understand that doing that is only going to strengthen Donald Trump? It, they're not going to they're not going to release something you know, like cuz every time they come out with something it's always like, well this is haha, here's a constitutional crisis for you. And everybody America's like, okay, no it's not and uh, we get it. I mean, it's, it's coming with the package. We got it. He tweets crazy things. Whoa, whoa, what an idea. Well, it's all about money, though. Um, So the two liberal cable networks have increased their audience by doing uh, We Hate Trump all the time. And there's there's an audience for that that comes in just to see that. So if they stop doing that, their audience goes down. So, for example, Greta Van Susteren on MSNBC did not do that. And therefore, her ratings were not very good. And she um, got replaced. So there, it's about money, ideology, of course, but it's also about money. So the New York Times understands that its readership is 90 percent liberal, and we're going to give that readership what they want rather than giving the folks the truth. And that's where it's really shifted. So it's a combination of ideology and money. And um, therefore, and you're right. Trump's base basically doesn't even listen to it anymore, and, and they dig in to support their guy against this assault. Um, one last topic on the G20 uh, with the meeting from Putin uh, or with Putin and uh, with everything that's happening in the United Nations uh, with, with uh, North Korea. Where, 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 what are we headed towards here, Bill? I think that the catering will be heavy on bananas. <laughs> at the, uh, <laughs> well, he is in summit. Germany, so I mean, uh, I've, right. I've heard they love there their bananas. A lot, there. a lot of fresh fruit. Right. Um, right. All of this stuff basically is schmoozing. All right. So the G20, nobody knows what that means. <laughs> it's supposed to be fostering uh, everybody's economy and, and doing deals to help everybody else, but it's a real, it's really a schmooze fest. The real interesting part is the Putin-Trump meeting. And um, Putin's got to give Trump something today. And I, I have predicted on BillOReilly.com that he'll come out, Putin will, and say, you know what, we're going we're gonna to scorn North Korea, too. We're, we're, we're gonna, we don't like that. But he's got to give Trump something, because if he doesn't, he's going to make an enemy out of Trump. And then he'll be the subject of tweets and all of that. <laughs> I mean, you know, you don't want to be t- – if you're Putin and your economy is terrible in Russia, which it is, you don't want to be Trump's enemy, you know. So I expect Putin to give him at least verbally something today. But the, the conference itself is just a schmooze fest. And, um, you know, they all have agendas. All countries have agendas. And they try to get a little here and a little there kind of deals and stuff like that. So that's what it's all about. Back with BillOReilly.com. Do you have to say it that way? BillOReilly.com? Or can you just say it, BillOReilly.com, like all normal human beings? It doesn't matter, really. Um, <laughs> it's how you're feeling it, Beck. Really? And right really? now, I don't believe I you are feeling I know, it I'm, at all. I am, thinking, <laughs> I am thinking of bananas right now. As I think of bananas, BillOReilly.com. I get it. Okay, so BillOReilly.com, uh, where you can uh, see his gear and his books and everything else and also get uh, his uh, take on the news every single day. Um, and he's launching his own TV show uh, at BillOReilly.com. Uh, and we'll continue our conversation with him here in just a second. 
Glenn Beck Program. Glenn Beck Program. Pat, Stu, uh, Bill O'Reilly's with us. Uh, Glenn just had a family issue he's got, he's got to resolve uh, for a few minutes. So he'll, he should be back any minute now. So, okay, sure. Uh, so, Bill, um, what, uh, what are your thoughts on uh, the GOP seemingly caving in now and just almost admitting that they, they're going to bring the Democrats in on this and we're going to go from uh, a Democrat light bill, which it was with the Republicans anyway, to a uh, full-on Democrat-inspired health care bill. They're just going to fix Obamacare. Well, I think that's a message to the uh, Republicans who are being um, very obstinate about compromising. And, and McConnell is, does, does what he always does. He's a Senate majority leader, of course. He says, OK, look, if you're not going to compromise with us to get at least a semblance of uh, free market back into the health care system, then you're going to have to deal with Chuck Schumer and these guys who are going to socialize it up. And we're going to have something really a lot worse. So that's that's the play. Um, you know, look, it's a very complicated thing. Obviously, a lot of people uh, are confused about it. And um, I think the big thing is that the Republicans have got to get something on the board. And if they don't, they risk losing the Senate in uh, 2018. And because they ha- the people are waiting for some kind of accomplishment. We need a mm-hmm. tax cut. We need new health care. We got a jobs report today, you know, very good jobs report. Trump should be running around screaming about that. The economy is getting better. Um, I think psychologically, big business likes Trump's uh, free marketplace philosophy. But, you know, we got to get uh, we as a country have to get stuff passed. And right now it's not happening. As a general philosophy, Bill, do you think it's okay to take these baby steps? Maybe you get a little bit out of this health care bill, or do you think you, you have to? Because the, the constituencies are so varied, you know, that you have to do that. And with the danger of uh, Obamacare, and then you have the insurance companies just saying, we're not going to issue any policies to Americans. Well, what's going to happen is that there are going to be a lot of people not going to be able to buy health insurance. And um, then you're really in trouble. So you have to basically stabilize first and then build on that. Why, why is it, though, and maybe, maybe it's just the way it feels to me, but it seems like it's always when we have, the, we have the executive branch, or Republicans have the executive, they have the Senate, they have the House. When Democrats are in that position, they never take baby steps. They get Obamacare done. Uh, when the Republicans are in the majority and have the White House, uh, we have to do baby steps. Why, why it's an is excellent that? question. Um, the Democratic Party is run now by the progressive left, which has intimidated mo- moderate Democrats. All but one, Joe Manchin, the senator from West Virginia. He seems to be the only one who will look at things and, and come up with a, a problem-solving idea. So whatever it is inside the Democratic hierarchy, the Democrats are afraid of their leadership. The Republicans are not. They're not mm-hmm. afraid of uh, Ryan or of uh, McConnell. And so very conservative Republicans say, look, we're just not going to go along with it because we want X, Y, and Z. There isn't the fear uh, that there is in the Democratic side. Democrats vote block. I mean, can you believe the case law might go down in the Senate? A law that is is, is so badly needed and and would protect all Americans and even uh, immigrants and illegal aliens. Everybody would be protected. And the Democratic Party is going to vote en bloc against it in the Senate. It's insane. But they are fearful because if they go against the hierarchy, they'll cut their money off. All right. Uh, The PACs control all of the money going to people running for reelection in the Senate and the House. And, and then they'll launch a primary. You know, if you're a moderate Democrat, the, the progressive leadership will put somebody up against you, a far left person up against you and fund them. And these people are scared to death of that. So that's why the Democratic Party votes en block, whereas the Republicans don't. I mean, the border is a good example of this, too, because it seems like a constant letdown by Republicans when they get into power. Health care sort of feels this way as well. And I think what's frustrating to a lot of people, Bill, is that. 
a lot of the people now who are saying we can't get a full repeal, we can't uh, have a much more aggressive free market health care plan. We have to settle for this because we have a bunch of varying constituencies, which I understand. That's, that's a very valid point. However, these same people, when they knew Barack Obama would veto it, did vote for stronger things. They acted as if they wanted those things when they knew it wouldn't pass. And that, I think, is what makes people so cynical about politics. Well, people are furious on both in both parties. They're angry that, you know, we have a, a, a dynamic country that our leadership in Washington is basically blunting. You know, and that's, you know, whether you like Trump or not, Trump basically um, rises above that and says, look, we're going to do X, Y, and Z on immigration. So what happens? Well, people don't come here now. I mean, it was a, a series of articles, even in the liberal press, where the uh, Central Americans and Mexico, Mexicans are saying, I'm not even going to bother. It's too expensive to do it, too dangerous to do it. And then if I get caught, I'm going to get shipped right back. So that the, the crossings on the southern border are way down, way down, not because of any legislation, not because of a wall, because that wall hasn't been built yet. Mm-hmm. Um, it's because of the perception that Trump is going to send us back. So that's the kind of leadership that that is appealing to many Americans and why Trump won. But the gridlock in Washington, my God, they don't get anything done. You can't get Kate's law mm-hmm. done. Yeah. You can't get yeah, that. Yeah, it it's is. Unbelievable. It's it's infuriating. <laughs> money, the money it's... dictates what these people do. Um, how do you expect the G20 uh, negotiations to to affect the global banana trade? I think the banana trade <laughs> after this show, the Glenn Beck show, it would be huge, right? He was, he was insincere about bananas. <laughs> <right? laughs> he I was kind of insincere. Yeah. Skyrocket. There's a lot of potassium involved, and we know that. All right. Now, uh, uh, the global warming people don't like potassium because it it can impact, you know, and make things a little warmer. But I still think that the banana trade is going to go through the roof uh, as this program spans the globe. <laughs> you really can do a monologue about anything. Yeah, you really can. You? Can. <laughs> That's you impressive. Can topic, I can do five on it, no matter what you want. Would you come back on the other side, Bill? I, w- I would love to get your take on Chris Christie this week. Uh, what his future could possibly oh, be. And his like wonder- a driver. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's about <laughs> as, as aggressive as it should be. Uh, 888 back. Bill O'Reilly is with us. Uh, Glenn is going to be back here in just a couple of minutes uh, to talk about Chris Christie, who, who may be the least popular governor in American history, according to polling. At, at <laughs> least who hasn't committed a major felony, right? At least, yeah. That's like the way it's going to turn I mean, out. <laughs> pretty amazing. Back with Bill here in just a second. 888 back is our phone number. Program. Back with the one and only, the uh, legend in his own mind, uh, Bill O'Reilly. <laughs> the what? Bill O'Reilly. What? Hey, oh, I, sorry, didn't, I didn't hear. I said a legend. Yes. In his own mind. Uh, <laughs> Bill O'Reilly from BillOReilly.com, who I, I don't appreciate the fact that he was on my program just a few minutes ago saying that I didn't take the, the seizure of bananas by the oppressed uh, as a riveting, <laughs> riveting story. And somehow I was belittling bananas, the banana industry, and uh, and the need, desire, and just craven want of bananas by the oppressed. You did take umbrage I to took, that? I took a little mm-hmm. umbrage to mm-hmm. that. Uh, Bill O'Reilly, uh, welcome back to the program. A couple of things. First of all, I heard you talk about the border wall here just a second ago. Do you think that a border wall is still going to happen Somewhat. It's not going to be a full border wall, but they mm-hmm. will put in, uh, you know, a high tech situation in, in various sectors that uh, they believe. Um, Without any movement on this now, with the trouble yeah. that he is having, does this happen as a, as something that he can run on and say, see, I told you I was building a wall and I, I have broken ground on a lot of the wall or is this, I need, uh, you know, I need these guys 
you know, in the Senate to help me to get started? No, I don't think so. Just today over in uh, Europe, he said that the uh, once again, that Mexico is going to pay for the wall. (laughs) Um, You know, he's going to do something. He can do it by executive order. Okay, all right. But there won't be a big, beautiful 40 foot wall with a beautiful door in it. There's going to be a big, you know, (laughs) for example, in in Texas, where you live in the Big Bend National Park, you're not going to have a wall there. It's very hard to get through and all of that. You don't need it. But, you know, in places like uh, Bisbee, Arizona, where, you know, there's a lot of trouble, then you'll see, you know, the thing go up. So okay. it's more of a symbolic thing right, okay. um, than anything else. It's quite an admission, though. I mean, we're not even sure six is. months into this uh, mm-hmm. thing, and it, it, this is the, his, his signature issue. And it doesn't seem like anyone actually believes he's going to build this thing at this point. And not even well, Ann Coulter. Yeah. But the mm-hmm. signature issue is really the economy. I mean, that that's really what it's all about. So... If the economy gets better and people are making more money and they feel more secure, they're going to give him a pass on some of the other things as yeah, long as yeah. the intent is there. And yeah. that, that's what's going okay. on. Okay. Um, let me, let me uh, switch uh, gears and, and talk about a couple of other things. First of all, uh, the, the, the beached whale uh, story that happened over the weekend. <laughs> oh, no, I, I confuse that with um, the other story of uh, uh, Chris Christie. Um, <laughs> In New Jersey. Why, why do you confuse that with the Chris I don't Christie know. story? That's weird. He it's was, beach related. Uh, he, he is the most unpopular governor in, uh, in America now. And that's saying something. There's only three people. Or is he number three so at the he's bottom? He's number four right now. The least four. popular governor, poll, as far as polling has ever shown. Um, and that is ahead of him. First of all, he's at 15%. That was taken before the beach incident. So <laughs> I would I would assume that's going to drop. Uh, the only the one, only governors ahead of him, 2006, Frank Murkowski in, in Alaska at 14 percent. He named his daughter to be senator. So that was not a popular move. Uh, 2008, Rod Blagojevich who went to 8 percent. Obviously, he's in prison. Yeah, yeah, he also uh, went to prison. And, and 2005, also a criminal charges against Bob Taft uh, in Ohio. He came in at 7 percent. So what what happened with Chris Christie? Well, Christie's play is this. He he knows that he's not going to do public service ever again. This is what I believe. All right, so he's out of the public service business. So what do you, what business does he want to get into besides importing bananas? Um, <laughs> he wants to get into the media business. All right. Mm. That's what he wants to do. Mm-hmm. Now, there's been all kinds of rumors in the New York area that he wants to do sports radio, uh, radio talk, mm-hmm. that kind of thing. So what better yeah. way to get his name out there as a controversial guy than to go to his lavish beach home as the state of New Jersey provides their governors when the uh, all the other beaches are closed because the state couldn't pass a budget. So he's the only one on the beach, and then he allows himself to be photographed in a lounge chair with his grin on his face. He knows what he's doing. He's, he's, uh-huh. he's engendering controversy to get his name out there so he'll get some kind of media play. But really? that's not a guy that, I mean, I don't, I'm not excited to tune in the guy who just gave his state the shaft. I mean, it's not like, oh, man, I can't no, wait to hear he, what he has he to say. He goes to sports. And he could go to he could go to uh, news too on the radio. I don't think he could do TV. Um, are you, are you fat he'll get me? he'll get a sampling back. He will. I mean, people around oh, I, here I, will will uh, tune him in. I think and, uh, I think you're right on politics. You know, radio is so heavily right, and Chris Christie has almost zero credibility uh, with the right, um, which is amazing because he went from. He, he he he'll go in and he'll and he'll shake it, you know. Um, so I, he's got that's what he's angling for, and I think he's going to get some kind of media contract. I do. That's amazing. I mean, because he doesn't really align with us policy wise, but for fat TV hosts that are male, this is a place for them at the yeah. place. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that really is. Yeah, we're all fat here. Maybe, maybe you want to use the word zoftig instead of you know fat's a little blunt are we getting a word of the day <laughs> i think we are Zoftig. i've never heard of Zoftig. use it in a sentence it's a german-based word back i picked it up when i was in berlin huh. <laughs> with the bananas 
Or maybe rotund. Yeah, rotund, I know. Okay. Rubenesque mm, is another one. But right. Zoftig is, uh, is not a pretty word. Uh, let's let's uh, switch gears to uh, the uh, baby in England, 11 months old, uh, national health care. They want to pull the plug. The We're waiting for the you know, English version of the Supreme Court to give the final ruling um, on whether they pull the plug on this baby. The baby has already been accepted to a hospital here in uh, America, in New York. The Vatican uh, has offered to take the baby at their Bambino uh, hospital. Uh, In fact, the Pope yesterday said they will issue the family a Vatican passport so the baby can be taken out of the hospital and make them Vatican citizens. What... uh, what, what do you think is about this story? Well, I, I think the uh, British authorities would be insane not to allow the Vatican to take the baby and treat the baby. And, you know, Trump has weighed in, said we'll take the baby here in the USA. And there'll be enough people, of course, to donate money to um, pay the bills and stuff like that. So if the British government, you know, says, no, we're going to allow the baby to die, that's going to be an enormously... Uh, big story that's going to be really bad for the, the UK. So I don't believe they'll do it. I, but I'd like to see them cooperate with the Vatican on that on a life issue like that. So what's what's amazing if you haven't followed the story, go to charliesfight.org. Charliesfight.org. Um, I, I think this is a battle for um, more than just the Western way of life. This this is a battle bill that is a. Um, is a bellwether on on our humanity as the West. Well, it certainly uh, goes right into the uh, euthanasia and abortion debate. And um, but you know, clear thinking human beings will say, look, if the baby um, is going to be treated, let the process play out. You know, why would you want to abort the process? So, yeah, you're right. I mean, these crazy, insane uh, choice people, um, not everybody is at that level who just say, you know, euthanasia, fine, whatever you want to do, fine. Uh, The state of Oregon, totally out of control, no limits on abortion. You can do whatever you want for whatever reason. There's nothing uh, stopping um, or protecting the fetus, the unborn. Um, we we reach a point in uh, in a moral conversation where you can't defend these kinds of actions, and the UK could not defend not allowing that baby every opportunity and their and its family. So, Bill, where do you? This is the, the Slate magazine uh, came out immediately and said the right's going to make this into death panels, of and course. of course, uh, and, and that's what this is. This is a death panel. Sure, it would, it would be a, the state ruling that this baby doesn't have the right to treatment. Yeah, to eat up more resources. Yeah, to treatment. Right. I mean, it's as simple as that, even though um, the baby is now has an opportunity to go away from the U.K. so that they don't have to deal with the situation any longer. So that's why I'm saying that the British aren't stupid. They're not going to do that. So if you have, can, can we just noodle this out for a second? If you have socialized medicine... Um, and, you know, you're going to have to ration uh, medicine, which they are. They're, they're so far in debt with their nationalized medicine over in Great Britain. It's killing them. Um, and they have to ration the care. So if you're rationing the care, you have to make those decisions that says this is not worth the investment because the odds of survival are so low. Um, what makes that argue from the the a, a logical point of view to a liberal that says, well, yeah, but why should this baby have a chance um, because they have wealth or access to money, but nobody else's baby has uh, that chance? We have to even the playing field and everybody has to have a fair shake. Well, when you're talking about life and death, there isn't a matter of uh, a comparative matter. It's a matter of if you can save the baby or you can elongate the baby's life, you do it. Um, and economics shouldn't 
enter into it. Um, I don't believe in socialized medicine. I lived in England for a year. I know that there's a backup. I know that in Canada, for example, you have to wait um, for complicated surgery, which is why thousands of Canadians come to the United States for it. So that that kind of the government makes calls the shots on life and death. That is not um, compatible with my view of life. And I think most people in America would say the same thing. We, we just don't want that. We don't want the government saying who lives and who dies because of money. Did you read the Pope's actual statement? I did not read it. You should, Bill. As a Catholic, I'd be interested in hearing what you have to say. Um, because he didn't say, um, he said, you know, this is a very complicated matter, which it's really not. It's not complex. The money is there. The baby has been offered treatment elsewhere. It's not complex at all. Um, but he, he was not John Paul, uh, who would have come out and had come out and said, you know, that big state making decisions for families is, is not right and the family needs to be empowered and, and all life is sacred. He didn't use any of that language. He said it was a complicated matter. He understood and... Um, we shouldn't reject um, the state being involved, uh, basically saying, you know, we, we, we need to understand that parents sometimes have a hard time with these decisions and shouldn't be left alone. It was a really um, treading the line um, kind of statement. All right, but he made the offer. Um, yes. So that's number one. And he is a different guy. Uh, he's not doctrinaire. He tries to get as many people as possible into his um, outlook or his point of view. And he doesn't like to make judgments about certain things because then he, he believes that alienates people and, and cuts off the conversation. So I'm, I'm a big action, speak louder than words guy. And I applaud what the Vatican is doing. I hope the UK takes their um, offer and sends the family to Rome. And, and let the life process play out there. And that would be a huge win for um, not only the family and the baby, but for the cause of life. And so that's what I hope happens. BillOReilly.com. BillOReilly.com is the website where you can hear Bill every single day. You launch maybe this fall with a new TV show? We're not sure yet what we're going to do with the TV thing. Um, it's uh, complicated, but um, uh, we're know. certainly going to upgrade the, <laughs> the uh, BillOReilly.com. And I, I loved how you said it this time, as opposed to the beginning of the interview, yeah. when I didn't feel the sincerity. No. <laughs> I, uh, I didn't. When I say BillOReilly.com, I mean it. When I say BillOReilly.com, I don't feel it. It's not the All same. Right. But... Zach, I want you to read uh, Legends and Lives of Civil War, because you need some relaxation. You need to get away. And there's nothing like a good Civil War book that will do that. That's right. I know you're a history buff. I know you like to learn and yes, accumulate yes. knowledge. Yes. Uh, Bill O'Reilly's got, it, really, I was in a bookstore, and it's shameful how many books he has. Uh, but they're all great. And great for your kids as well. Uh, history at BillOReilly.com. Thanks, Bill. Talk to you next all week. All right, back. We'll talk soon. Thank you.